podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by DirecTV Stream. DirecTV Stream is your home for football this season because it's the best way to catch the games you won't want to miss. And with the DirecTV Stream Sports Hub, you can follow your favorite teams and track scores all in one place. That means more ways to follow the biggest hits, drives, and wins this season. So many you may need your own touchdown dance. So get your sports together and get your TV together at directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. On a beautiful run through the park on a pleasant day, you can easily get lost. No, no, no. She didn't kill him. Huh? In your true crime podcast. It was the pool guy. So obvious. Whatever motivates you works for us. It's all about letting your run be your run. And Brooks is here for every runner, doing the research and sweating the details to create gear that works for you. It's your run. Brooks, run happy. So here we are then, the first of my, I'm not going to say famous, but uh, now regular video diaries from Trips Abroad, um, talking a bit about what I've been up to, what I've been doing. If you're listening to this without video, head over to my Instagram and you can see the first couple of minutes of uh, what I've been talking about and why, I suppose. And if you're watching this, then head over to the podcast and listen to the full version of what is essentially a love tennis Podlet, uh, which we try and do most days during Grand Slams. I I didn't do one yesterday because, well, it was a very difficult night and uh, some logistical issues, but here I am. So I'm going to look back on Monday and Tuesday, uh, which will also kind of encompass my my early thoughts about Flushing Meadows. It's a venue I've never been to before, actually. Uh, New York as a whole, I came to when I was seven, which is obviously a long time ago and I don't really remember it. So I, I kind of have been saying to people that I've never been to New York because functionally that's true. Um, where to start, really? Uh, if you watch my last one, I talked a bit about Midtown and Manhattan and kind of, you know, the place itself. What I should do... Mm, no, I was going to turn the air conditioning off, but I think the audio is okay. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, Flushing is out in Queens. Uh, I've been getting the Long Island Railroad out there, which a nice little foray into New York commuter trains. Uh, it's great, incidentally. It's a lot quicker than the buses, the media buses. Uh, it takes about 19 minutes. It goes from Penn Station, which is two blocks from where I am. See, I'm using all the terminology now. Blocks. Pen. Uh, it is literally called Penn Station. That's not really terminology. Uh, but, yeah, so it, it's kind of fun bit of a novelty really it's probably gonna wear off pretty quickly but um i like to kind of feel like i'm part of the city when when i'm there i don't like getting cabs everywhere or you know um tournament transport it's not doesn't always make you feel part of it so monday was the first day of the tournament of course i had been to the media day on friday and saturday and spoken to a few players and things and you know monday of a grand slam is always manic it's particularly manic when one of the greatest players of all time has just announced that she's going to retire. Not just one of the greatest players of all time, a six-time champion here in New York, a 23-time Grand Slam champion overall, and perhaps the most significant tennis player of all time. Uh, It's hard and takes a long time to talk about who is the greatest player of all time, but there is a strong argument that Serena Williams is the most significant player of all time. She wasn't the first black person to win a Grand Slam but she certainly was the most significant and this week we've heard so many people say not just that Serena Williams is an inspiration but that if it were not for Serena Williams I would not be here that that was literally what Naomi Osaka said it was what Coco Goff said and it's what so many others said it's what Oprah Winfrey said in her um, audio message to Serena which was played after the end of her match against Danke Kovinic. Before which, by the way, there was half an hour of (laughs) all sorts. Uh, One of my colleagues here in the press pack often says that the Brits do pageantry better than anyone else. And it kind of came up particularly when Centre Court had its centenary 
and they had a big thing at Wimbledon this year and people have seen it they had loads of champions there Federer was there of course um, and Sue Barker presented it with a bit of Johnny McEnroe and you know it was great and a bit kind of cringe but mostly pretty good um, this was different this wasn't pomp and ceremony and gravitas this is the American version of all those words in by which I mean of course it's bigger better more patriotic um, or at least by their standards maybe not so much but um, an amazing rendition of the national anthem by Anika Tony Rose Anika Noni no, I'm going to mispronounce this and I'm going to apologise in advance Anika Noni Rose um, who is an actress and singer and I'm told she voiced Tiana uh, Disney's first black American princess which is obviously again kind of fitting that she on opening night on Serena Williams's big night was singing not necessarily because she's black but because she's a significant person in terms of representation within society and Serena Williams is so so much a part of that in America and around the world quite frankly all of it was great mostly what it did mean that a seven o'clock match didn't start until about 7 40 uh, even once Danka Kovinic, the the biggest B-side or the smallest B-side, the most B-side player in tennis history, maybe, uh, even once she had uh, made her way onto the court, there was then another montage uh, with, I think, Queen Latifah doing the voiceover. And then Serena came out, dressed amazingly. Of course, Serena has her own fashion line. She's a fashion icon for so many people. Uh, she was wearing a dress made from six layers, I believe, uh, to represent her six US Open titles, but she then said, but I had to take four of them off because it was too heavy. Um, and this came in the form of a kind of tear-away skirt. It wasn't Buck's Fizz, but it was much shinier for a start. Uh, but it, yeah, she took it off before she even warmed up for the match, which was a decent match, to be fair. I mean, you know, it, it was it, kind of, the tennis was kind of secondary. Danka Kovic played a part, and she, she hit some great shots, um and proved that she is a player. Serena Williams played better than she has for a long time. Um, Chrissy Everett got a bit of stick on ESPN comms for saying it was she hadn't seen her play like this for five years. I, I don't think that's necessarily true, but certainly for a while. And it was impressive, you know, to not just because of what she did, but there's a lot of pressure in that situation. She this was not about Danka Kovinic on any level. This was about Serena Williams delivering for. 25,000 absolutely raucous fans. And this is kind of something that's unique to Flushing Meadows. For people who haven't been here, tennis fans here are completely different. Uh, for a start, the stadium is noisy all the time. You know, no, it's not like Wimbledon where this, there's this kind of hush, you know, and then there's a point one, and then there's polite applause, and then there's a hush. You know, and then someone shouts, come on, Tim, and everyone goes, ha, 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 and then moves on. This is totally different. No one's ever really settled. People are coming in and out of the bowl the whole time. Um, Arthur Ashe itself is an absolute monster of a stadium. Uh, I went up to the very top deck today where the snipers are. Um, and, yeah, it's high. You're not really watching tennis at that point. You're just kind of drinking it in, so literally for a lot of people. Albeit it costs you 15 bucks for a small beer, so I wouldn't bother. Um, speaking of which... So, that's, uh, yeah, that was Monday night, and it was pretty amazing. I'm not the biggest Serena fan in the world, but just to experience the noise and the depth of feeling, the depth of emotion people have about Serena Williams, you know, sitting in front of people who are living every point, and who had been, you know, Coco Goff said she'd been coming to the US Open every year since she was eight, she played earlier in the day on Monday, and then she thought, right, I'm, I'm going to go home because, you know, I've got to go rest and stuff, and I'll watch it on TV. And then she sort of was stretching after her match, and she said, no, I mean, eight-year-old me would kill to be at this, and I owe it to eight-year-old me to be there. So she promptly was, along with any number of celebrities. Spike Lee did the coin toss. Um, Mike Tyson was there. Martina Navratilova, obviously. Billie Jean King any number of tennis legends. Bill Clinton was there. Queen Atifa, of course. 
um, Vera Wang, the fashion designer as well. You know, all walks of life, which kind of sums up Serena. She has touched all walks of life. And and that deserves recognition, you know, in a big way. Um, in terms of tennis, elsewhere, uh, because well, it would be easy to believe there weren't any other matches there on Monday. Um, there were plenty, of course. First round day, always absolutely insane. You, you never can watch enough tennis. You always miss the big story, inevitably. Um, Andy Murray made his comeback to the main draw uh, in successfully. Beat Francisco Cherandolo in three sets, three grueling sets. It was really hot and humid, and it was the middle of the day. Two hours 40, I think the three sets were. And Murray played really well. Uh, and we'll see how his body recovers because he's playing again tomorrow against Emilio Nava on Ash, the American wildcard. But yeah, he did play really well, and it was quite impressive actually. And he was really glad that he hasn't he's had a bit of cramp over this North American hardcore swing, and he was pretty glad that they got over that. So um, yeah, it was, it was just good to see from a British perspective. Uh, the Brits have got four men through to the second round, which apparently hasn't happened. I thought for a while, but not for two years. So, not that long. A um, few other notable results. Uh, sad to see Maxime Cressy pull out injured. He's obviously been in some quite good form this year, and it's his home slam. Uh, brilliant to have Carl Edmund back playing main draw of Grand Slams. Kasper Ruud shoved him aside pretty unceremoniously, to be honest, in two and a bit hours. But he's here, and for Kyle, that didn't at one point look like it might never be possible again. So... Would love to see him back in the top 50 where he belongs. He's got the game to do that. Um, so, you know, long may it continue. Um, history for China on Monday uh, as Wu Yibing uh, made it through to the second round. China had never even had a man in the main draw first round in the open era, and they had two. Um, Zhang, who I picked in fantasy, naturally therefore blew a two-set lead over Tim Van Richter. He had seven match points all of which he failed to convert, and Van Richthofen won it in five. So you have to kind of feel for Zhang. But Wu is through, has a very good chance of winning in the next round as well. I think he's playing Nuno Borges. And, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a really nice guy. I spoke to him afterwards. Um, you know, he's he's got a nice story. His dad was a boxer and then made his son take up tennis at four because, well, first of all, he tried badminton, didn't like it. Net was too high, apparently. And then he tried tennis quite like that, and they wanted little Wu to lose some weight. So that's why he started playing tennis. Um, I'm going to write something a bit later in the week about about that. So, um, you know, keep your eyes peeled. A uh, few other results. Stan Wawrinka retired injured again, which is really, really unpleasant. You know, he's a guy who we know can do a lot more than that. And we know has something to offer and is fighting so hard to get back. And, yeah, it's just not there yet. Um, on the women's side, probably the most surprising thing about Monday on the women's side was fewer shocks. Harriet Dart was one of them. She beat number 10 seed Daria Kasatkina. And Harriet Dart, by the way, has a chance to become British number one. More on that in the second half. Uh, what other significant results do we have on Monday? I mean, not many. Leila Fernandez back at the US Open for the first time since making the final. She beat Ocean Dodda in the first round. Um... Good wins also for, well, confidence-boosting wins for Annette Kontovite. Kontovite, beg your pardon. Uh, Barbara Kretsikova as well. Someone who needed a win and needed a good straight sets win, which is what she got. Um, Zhang Shui knocking out Jill Teichman. It's technically an upset, although I think a lot of people might have picked that one if I'd pressed them for it. Um, there was maybe the most notable bit, or at least a notable bit, Anna Konju who had surgery on a broken leg earlier this year, lost six love, six love to Beatrice Haddon Meyer. Not nice. And obviously historic and for all the wrong reasons. Um, loads of other results on Monday, which I'm sure you've already caught up with, and they're all playing again, the winners anyway, on Wednesday. So uh, you'll catch up with them then as well. Uh, Kyrgios Kokinakis, of course. Kyrgios won in straight sets. is the most uncomfortable he's ever been on a tennis court. Um, so yeah, that was worthy of note. Uh, second half, we'll talk about Tuesday, and I'll try and look ahead to Wednesday as well. So Tuesday at the Open, what did that mean? Um, it meant lots of things. It uh, it meant we could complete the singles draw, albeit we didn't quite 
complete the single draw because there was rain and uh, just at the end of the night so I think there are three matches carrying over um, that weren't being played on the roofed courts uh, so that was a bit of a disappointment as I speak Naomi Osaka is playing on one of the roofed courts uh, specifically Ash and she's losing to Daniel Collins she's a set down uh, which would not be great for the tournament to be honest it might be great for me later in the week because I quite fancy getting the baseball uh, but anyway that's not what you want to hear you want to hear about the tennis uh, what did I watch today I started on Nori Pear which you know was a match involving Benoit Pair, so as you can imagine, there was some controversy, there was some tanking, there was some bagels, and occasionally there was some stupendous tennis. Uh, first of all, it was incredibly hot, again, probably hotter today than it was yesterday, about 32 degrees, about 60% humidity. The heat rule was in play, and it actually didn't get used in that match, but there was a delay because a spectator was taken ill in the stands, I was out on the stands for five games because it was roasting hot. I had to go back down and uh, watch it on the telly and then come back up and do that kind of thing and try and stay cool. It was really hardcore. Cam Norrie doesn't play with a hat on because he loves it. Uh, he says he doesn't love it when it's boiling uh, afterwards, but he does say it's better for me when it is because it usually hurts the other guy more. Um, Benoit Pair tanked the first set in 19 minutes. He then played quite well in the second set and fought a tie break. In Cam's words, played a very loose tiebreak and then tanked the third set and lost it in 19 minutes, I think. Um, I mean, Benoit's gone through a lot, as far as I can tell. That's certainly what he says. And, you know, you can't blame him for turning up for the paycheck because it's £55,000 and no one doesn't need £55,000. But the guy needs some help. Um, and I hope he gets some. You know, because if he's struggling as badly as he says he is, then he really needs it. And, you know, you watch someone do their job badly, someone who's supposed to be one of the hundred best people in the world at their job, and they do it that badly, and you think, well, okay, you're probably not quite all there. Let's go and sort it out. So, you know, bon, bon courage, as they say. Bon courage, Benoit. Um... There was a really good match at the same time breaking out on centre on Ash between Carlos Alcaraz and Sebastian Baez, who I hope he doesn't continue to be this just kind of bloke who's always the plucky second other side of great matches. But um, he and Alcaraz ran and ran and ran for two and a half hours through the first two sets and a bit. And actually Alcaraz had taken both of them 7-5, but... You know, he had been pushed pretty blooming hard by Baez, who, who is a very decent player, and I think he's inside the world top 40 now, so he's one of the best unseeded players. He may have been the next one off the block, you know, the 33rd seed, if you like. Uh, and there were, there were moments when it looked like he was going to nick that, that second set. He um, he had a break, at f he served at 4-3, having broken Alcaraz, but then was immediately broken back, and and then eventually dropped it 7-5, and then, and then uh, he was two love down in the third, and uh, his leg just seized up completely, with cramp as far as I can tell. He had a medical timeout uh, at the end of the second set, and I think the the heat and the, you know, playing Carlos Alcaraz on a slow hard court pretty much caught up with him, so he'll be back. Uh, I've absolutely no doubt about that, and, and he'll do a great job, so um, I wouldn't worry about him too much, but uh, yeah, one to watch for the future. A um, few good five-setters today, as there always are in the first round. Andre Rublev getting dragged into a five-setter by Laszlo Gere, which is, you know, he did have a two-set lead, and then he had a big dip. This is the man we used to call the king of the 250s. He should be a pro at putting away guys like Laszlo Gere. And uh, he's just had a horrible summer, to be quite frank. Andre Rublev is, is in all sorts of trouble when it comes to form. Uh, I've no doubt that you can probably count some of that to the fact that his homeland is, you know, in strife, to say the least. And I, I can only imagine that's pretty stressful. I mean, not as stressful, you could argue, as what the Ukrainian players are going through. But that doesn't mean that his, you know, it's not legal to be Russian. He didn't validate the invasion. He didn't choose to invade Ukraine. He's, to an extent, as much of a victim as anyone else in these things. Um, and we certainly shouldn't, you know, downgrade his pain. 
Anyway, that may not be the case, but he's re- playing tennis really badly, so I can certainly say that with confidence. Uh, but he made it through uh, in five sets, just about, but probably not glad of spending four hours on court in the very hot conditions. That's the thing. At the US Open especially, and you know it's the same at the Aussie, you really need to not drop at sets in early rounds because it just takes the legs out of you. And so I would suggest that guys like Lorenzo Mazzetti, who went to five with David Goffin, who someone tweeted in their spot on, David Goffin's always on an outside court somewhere in a five-set epic. And it's true, and he lost it by two points, basically, because it was 11-9 in the tiebreaker in the fifth set, which is just, I mean, just brutal. Um, I think Mazzetti, three match, two match points he had, and then, yeah, eventually. I mean, it was just break central by the end. Um, it was 5-2 Goffin in the final set, and then there were f- uh, four or five breaks of serve in the last seven games, which is just crazy, obviously, but probably a testament to how exhausted they were. Um, anyway, Musetti got through just about, but yeah, you know, he's one who you can think now, well, hmm, hang on, I think you probably should have got through that match, mate, and you know, we wouldn't have to worry about you in the, the later rounds. Same can be said of his compatriot Yannick Sinner. He went to five sets of Daniel Altmaier despite having had uh, a two sets to one lead and looking pretty in control, to be honest, but managed to drop the fourth. Uh, and you could say the same about Fabio Fanini, except that he's always in a five setter. Denis Shapovalov definitely shouldn't have been in a five setter. I know um, Husler, the Swiss lad, has played some decent tennis in the last week or two, but, you know, Denis Shapovalov needs to put him away in three sets, not. Admittedly, five quite quick sets. They only, I think they did f- three hours on the dot, maybe for five sets, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, come on, Dennis, let's uh, let's get on with it, man. Let's get home, get in the bath. Um, Rafa Nadal won today as well. He dropped a set to Rinky Hijikata, but Rafa Nadal will will be fine. He will warm his way into the tournament because. He's a pro, uh, and he's, you know, won two grand times this year. Probably going to win a third. Uh, women's side today, uh, who did I watch? Oh, a bit of Shontek. She beat Jasmine Paolini pretty comfortably, 6-3, six, 6 love. Did what Shontek does at her best. I, I actually didn't think she would be at her best today necessarily, but she started fast, which is great news for her, and probably not bad news for the tournament, to be honest. I think we could do with Shontek in some big epic matches, but we're going to need someone to take her on. Is that woman Zheng Xinwen? Might well be. Six foot one, 19 years old, she's Chinese, she's just outside the seeds, and she has promptly stolen the draw of one of them by beating Yelena Ostapenko in three quite tight sets. Um, it was always going to be a tight match, I think, this. I picked it as my one to watch for Tuesday in the Inside Tennis Newsletter, which I recommend you sign up for by going to inews.co.uk slash my account uh, and you can get a daily newsletter from me in your inbox every morning during the slams but uh, yeah Ostapenko had opportunities in, in the final set, she had a two love lead and then lost her serve again and then she broke again and, and it went, I think it was level until 4-5 and then she was broken at 4-5 which you know it's just finding big serves under pressure is, is such a skill. And so often you see people who can do it get themselves out of trouble. I mean, I always talk about Djokovic being like the most incredibly clutch server on pressure points. And it's a massively underrated skill. Everyone talks about his returning and his flexibility and his resilience. But honestly, the guy is a freak at like 30 all. You know, second serve 30 all. He just hits a spot or finds an ace at love 30 and things it's just it's crazy it's crazy the guy the guy as i say he's an absolute freak um few other results no venus williams kind of bounced out by alison van oitvank um bit of shade from venus afterwards you know said can you pay some tribute to your opponent and venus said well i've seen her play before and i think this is her best ever match of tennis because i've seen her play before and, and then there was this sort of pause and she said well, she played a much better level today. You know, it was it was pretty shady. Um, but anyway, Venus is out. She can play doubles with Serena. 
on Thursday they kick off in the first round. Um, and then Emirata Kanu, the defending champion, out on Louis Armstrong Stadium, was at best half full, started about quarter full, eventually maybe got half full. And Elise Corne just, for want of a better phrase, she old manned her. And I, to be fair, I think she played better than that. But Elise Corne is 32 years old. She played 63 Grand Slams in a row. And she knows how to beat big players. I mean, you know, she's beaten Serena Williams. She's beaten any number of top 10 players. She beat Igor Shontek at the French 2021. You know, this is, this is a serious player. And she kind of sliced and diced a bit. She brought Raducanu forward a lot. She had, I love Elise Corny's backhand. It's kind of flat and bunty, and she just forms it really well. And and because she moves well, she's so often in position to play it, play it strongly. And yeah, I just don't think Raducanu had any answers. She said she had a blister, but tried not to blame that. It was quite windy, but you know she said it was the same for both players. What she did say that was pretty interesting is this is a clean slate for her, and that she's almost happy to be. Walking away from Flushing Meadows, world number 80 she'll be. And actually, if Harriet Dart wins on Wednesday, she'll be the British number two. And she's kind of looking forward to just building her career. And she says she's going to claw her way back up the rankings. She'll go and play the 250s. I mean, you know, she's going to have to play the 250s because she ain't getting into premiers automatically. And, uh, yeah, she'll she'll go and scrap. And, you know, I look forward to seeing it because, yeah, why not? Everyone has different phases of their career. Why why can't Raducanu have a scrapping phase? You know, don't call it a comeback, as I believe someone once sang. I think it was a rapper. I'm not very good on this stuff. Um, yeah, the, the, obviously it's first round day, so crap loads of results. We're going to very quickly look at Wednesday. Um, Serena Williams is playing again. She is up against Annette Kontervite, uh in a night session. That's a midnight in the UK. Kontervite's not in great form. She talked in the press conference a bit like she was just looking forward to the experience and certainly wasn't expecting to win. Um, so we could have Serena Williams into the third round, quite frankly. And, well, I don't want to say after that who knows, but, I mean, if she won it, it would be an absolutely monstrous occasion. I mean, I, I can't tell you how electric that would be given what her first round was like. So, uh, yeah, we wait with interest. By the way, if Serena wins that, she plays either... Alia Tomljanovic or Yevgenia Rodina, probably Tomljanovic, you would think. Um, so, pff, it's winnable, isn't it? I mean, bloody hell, anyone can win a Grand Slam in WTA. I wasn't sure that this Serena Williams is one of them, but I'm starting to think she might be. So, yeah, who knows? Uh, so, yeah, do, do try and stay up for that because it will be electric. Um, also, do try and stay up for Draper versus Audrey Aliassime. Jack Draper's been playing really well. He's really relaxed. I had a good chat with him the other day, and, and he just seems like he's really enjoying it and just loving being on tour and in a main draw of the US Open and just chilling out with lots of the other British lads who are going well. Um, what are the other good matches? Tommy Paul against Seb Corder, All-American. Going to get decent billing. I think it's on Grandstand. Um, and that, that'll be a good match to watch as well. Nick Kyrgios against Benjamin Bonzi. Never bad to watch. As I mentioned, Murray against Nava. I think that's first on, so that'll be a kind of 5pm match for you back in the UK. Um, in the women's, I mean, any number of decent matches. Zhi Yu Wang against... Oh, Wang Zhi Yu, beg your pardon, against Maria Sakari. Um, could be something brewing there, I suspect. Harriet Dart has a chance to get into the third round of the US Open for the first time. A really good chance as well. She's got Dalma Galfi, the world number 91. And Dart, if she wins that, will overtake Emma Raducanu in the world rankings, which is an incredible state of affairs. Um, other decent matches that I think you should watch, Leila Fernandez against Ludmila Samsonova. Samsonova won a title last week. She's in really good form. Uh, Beatrice Haddad Maia, uh, one of the form players of the summer, the Brazilian, up against uh, former champion here, Bianca Andreescu. And Carolyn Garcia against Carolyn Skaya could be quite fun. I love watching Carolyn Garcia. I think she's elite and oh on Jabour against Elizabeth Mandlick um, one of the American wild cards again Jabour just a good player to watch so that's Wednesday I think I've done pretty well to sum up two and a half days in something like 20 minutes uh, I will try and be back after the second round Sports Social Podcast Network <laughs>